Erin, you're on the screen. Can we test your audio? Hello. Oh. And I, I actually, <laughs> sorry, y'all. Oh, that's great. I love it. It's, yeah. Being unmuted might be a risk um, that, that we're taking, but uh, we'll just give it a shot. Um, I don't have a presentation to share on the screens, so, um, but I did just want to talk to y'all a little bit about Nashville Community Darkroom. Is this, is it time for me to talk? Um, so um, for those of you that don't know, uh, Nashville Community Darkroom is over in East Nashville on Hart Lane. Um, near Ellington Parkway. And we are, we function like a co-op. We're, we're uh, Nashville's only public darkroom space. Um, and one of the only um, public darkroom spaces in the Southeast. Uh, we have um, about between 15 and 20 members from month to month. Um, and we're always looking for more. And we function a lot like a co-op. So uh, our members join, they pay a low monthly rate and then um, they have free access to the space to, to use it as much or as little as they want. Um, and we, um, we provide all of the chemicals and equipment that you would need. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our actual space um, in a minute. Um, but we, uh, in order to keep our membership rates low, we just have um, a, I'm sorry, uh, in order to keep our membership rates low, we just have um, a purely volunteer run organization. And so we all just take turns um, um, maintaining the space and welcoming new members. Um, and it's really a, a nice uh, mix of people. Um, so in our lighted work area, we have uh, about, I'd say, it's probably about 800 square feet um, in the lighted workspace, we have a light table, film and print dryers, workspace for finishing prints and finishing supplies. Um, we have a, a, a pretty rudimentary flatbed film scanner, uh, but we do have plans for an upgraded flatbed scanner and a DSLR scanning station um, in the works. So we hope to have that, I mean, I say scanning, you know, pho negative photographing station, I guess. Um, and then we also have a basic portrait studio set up um, with paper backdrop, seamless paper, um, a roll up door for people that wanna shoot natural light. And we have a few um, strobes that are available for member use as well. And then in the dark room, uh, we have five enlargers uh, so that uh, people can make prints. Um, it's a little tight for five people at once, but it allows for, you know, at least two or three to work at the same time. Uh, we have all of the chemicals, trays, um, negative carriers for every format of film, all the way from 110 up to four by five, and then even five by seven on one and larger. Um, and so anyway, I just, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the space itself for anybody that doesn't know. Um, it's a great place to work. If you already know how to use a dark room, uh, you can join up and you can just come in and work on your own 24 seven. You don't have to reserve space ahead of time. You just come and work. So if you're an all, if you want to pull an all nighter, you can do that. Um, or you can come in like I do in the, in the mornings and work, um, you know, while kids are at school and stuff. Um, if you don't already know how to use a dark room and you're interested in that, um, that's where we're making some changes this year. And so uh, we have always offered basic film developing and basic printmaking in a small group setting. But um, during COVID, uh, we were closed for a little while and we had to really kind of rethink our group um, offerings. And so uh, we thought we would just be doing these one-on-one -on -one sessions temporarily, but they've been really um, in demand. So we're offering more one and one, one on one sessions. If you want to book a session to just come in um, and have a lesson that's tailored to your skill level, um, you can do that in uh, film developing or printmaking. And then coming next month and in November, we're hoping to offer um, a few smaller group classes, uh, maybe four people max. Um, 
And then, so those classes that we will be offering back onto the schedule would be intro to film developing in black and white and intro to black and white printmaking. Um, and then uh, we're also gonna be offering some new classes that we're very excited about. Um, so we'll be adding a intermediate um, black and white printing class for people that already have the basic skills down and want a little bit more. Um, and we're gonna do some, um, I'm gonna teach a lumen and sun printing class um, with the, some different sun printing and lumen uh, printing methods that you can do. Uh, it, you can do them in our space, of course, but um, you don't have to have a dark room or a camera or anything, cameraless printing with um, different um, materials. And then let's see, we also, oh, we're working with someone to offer a modern Polaroid printmaking um, class. So Polaroid films, um, many have been discontinued, but they've recently started remanufacturing some Polaroid films that are, uh, are pretty successful. And so um, Michelle is gonna come in and do some, I believe Michelle is a member of SNAP, but I don't know if she's here or not. Um, but we're talking with her about doing a, a Polaroid demo and maybe a, with a hands-on component of some kind. Um, in the next couple of months. So that's exciting. And then in the coming year, we have some really exciting stuff, um, which we will have further details on, hopefully by the time the next meeting rolls around. Um, and that'll include some partnership programming with Boutique Film Lab. Uh, Ryan's talked to us about doing some um, classes on uh, not only color de developing, but maybe also optimizing what you shoot for your, uh, for your lab uh, to make the lab happy. Um, and then um, we'll do a color film developing class uh, that covers hand developing uh, your own color film, uh, color negative film. And then a, a pinhole workshop, uh, another cyanotype workshop that's um, a little more involved where we'll get to code our own papers and Van Dyke Brown printing. And then uh, we have a new artist in town um, who is going to be teaching the photographic book. And uh, that'll sort of focus on sequencing and binding your images. So, um, and that could go for darkroom images or digitally printed images. So those are really exciting. And I just, I wanted to, uh, you know, give you guys a little bit of introduction to the darkroom. We'd love to see any of you there. And if you just want to come take a look at it, you can, uh, get in touch with me. I'll put my name in the chat and uh, contact info. Um, but we would love to see you guys around there more. We're really focusing uh, in the next year on improving the community aspect of the darkroom and not just being, you know, little mole people in our solo darkroom. So we would love to see you more. <laughs> Aaron, uh, and I'm happy to ask any, answer any questions if you have any. I'm seeing in the chat, people wanted to know your website. So I put in there nashvillecommunitydarkroom.org. Oh, yes, that is correct. Yes, it's nashvillecommunitydarkroom.org. We are also on Instagram and Facebook. We don't have a great presence there, but we're working on it. Um, we're working on getting some better, more interesting content on there. Um, and... and I may have missed it, but did you talk about the new sustaining membership and all those oh, great things? No, thank you. I think this group would so, be very interested in that. Yes. So one thing that we are um, reintroducing, we had this available when we first opened and then um, it kind of dropped off the radar. We've been open uh, eight years now, which is pretty exciting. Um, but we are uh, reintroducing our sustaining member program. Um, that is, you know, if you aren't ready to be a monthly member at the darkroom, if, if that's not something you're interested in, whether you don't work in it, you don't know how or not interested, um, our sustaining members can pay a monthly membership of any amount, um, you know, even $5 a month. And sustaining members get first notice on all of our events and classes and a discount on all of our events and classes. Um, uh, for the registration fees. Um, and we're hoping to expand that program a little bit to help us um, be a little bit more financially solvent. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great resource to have here in Nashville. And 
you know, if you're, if you're not ready to work in a dark room, but you're glad it's here and you want to help support us, that's a great way to do that. And I will put that link in our, um, in the chat as well. Don't, does SNAP have a lot of film shooters? Um, SNAP has a good mix. People doing alternative processes mm -hmm. in film. Uh, I would say most people are, it seems to me most people are digital, but that mm -hmm. could be because they've converted their film to digital. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and you said you all have a flatbed scanner. and We do. <laughs> and, um, I'm in the process of building us a new copy stand for um, uh, for digitizing prints and films. So I hope we'll have that ready pretty soon too. Um, and then a lot of the coming workshops, the Van Dyke Brown and the Cyanotype, um, you know, those processes use a digitally uh, created negative for contact printing a lot of the times now. So um, those classes would be great right. for right. film photographers or um, or digital photographers that want to expand into making handmade prints from their images. Oh yes, disposable cameras. I I would love to do some kind of a disposable uh, camera component, Deshaun. I think that sounds fun. Okay, I um, think that's all the questions. Okay. Well, Does thanks. anybody else have any questions? All right. Thank you very much. It's good to hear yes. about your dark room. Yes, and I'm putting my um, email, my direct email in the um, contact and my phone number. So if any, in the chat, I'm sorry. Uh, so if anybody has any questions or if you just want to come see the dark room because you're curious, please reach out. I love giving people tours and demos whenever I can. Um, so yeah, anytime. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Aaron. With you the host. Okay. Carl, do you have anything you want to say prior um, to us getting started? I just want to talk about the one little thing. Just stand behind his computer. All right. Okay. Yes. I can stop the recording for that. <laughs> if you're going to throw things at me, make it something I can eat. All right. The only thing I want to talk about before Wayne starts is to we do have our JCC show coming up. Emily just put out the call for submissions. The show dates are December 1st through the 31st. The deadline for getting the pictures in is October 26th. That was all I need. And then now we have Wayne who's going to talk about his building a raft, his documented documentation of building a raft and going down the Mississippi. Hey, um, Carl, this is Emily. Can I add a little, one little thing about our other show? Oh. The Hotel Preston show? Sure. Um, everybody look forward to the fact that uh, Jo Fields has volunteered again. She's slammed right now, but within the next uh, short period of time, she's going to have a um, promo card that we can all use on our social media and emailing friends and so forth to encourage people to go. You know, you might, there, there's not gonna be a formal uh, reception per se, but you might get a couple of friends and, you know, meet them out there. And it's a fabulous show. I really want so, I want so much for Nashville to see this show. It's, it's really top notch. So thank you, Joe. If thank she's you. on here, if she's not, thank you in the <laughs> abstract. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. All right, now, Wayne, it's all you. Thank you. All right. Um, this is, uh, I'd like to tell you uh, something about something that happened 40 years ago this summer. Um, I uh, met some folks when I was, uh, I was a junior at Vanderbilt University and I was on their uh, Vanderbilt Abroad 
program during my junior year. And uh, uh, I was at the University of Regensburg in what was then West Germany. And uh, I met some folks uh, from the United States who were there from the University of Colorado. So I'm trying to get your screen. On. Do you want to share your screen yet? Sure. Go ahead and share what you want to share. Okay. Because they're all saying they're, they're, we're looking at you, Emily. So <laughs> now we got the screen. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Um, so I met some folks uh, uh, that were there on an exchange program with the University of Colorado at Boulder and uh, made some friends there who built, uh, who took some inflatable rafts and floated down the Danube River from Regensburg uh, to uh, Budapest, Hungary. And uh, so they, after that experience, they got together and decided, well, when we get it back to the States, we ought to do the same thing, except on a different river. And so, so I didn't know anything about this at the time, but uh, they knew I was a photographer. There was a, a dark room in the basement of my dorm in Regensburg. And uh, so uh, in probably uh, April, of 1981 after we had all graduated, I got a phone call from Tom Bates up in Kansas City and he said, hey, we're building this raft um, and we're gonna float down the Missouri and Mississippi rivers to New Orleans. And we were wondering if you could come along and take pictures. So I said, yeah, that sounds, I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything special at the time. So I flew up and uh, they were already building the raft or had just started. They were in uh, La Benite, uh River Park, which is actually in Independence, Missouri, um, just that side of Kansas City. Um, so uh, we got together and we built this raft. It was, uh, the main deck was 16 by 24 feet and it had a cabin on it. The, we, uh, it floated on 24, 55 gallon oil drums. Um, and uh, we strapped the oil drums to the a wooden superstructure underneath. You can see here, this, this photograph, this is, um, uh, we're, we're working on the center beam, uh, putting that together with one inch all thread um, and this is this is Rick Rotman here, uh, and this is uh, Rick and Clegg and Tom there on the on the right, and Afa um, Afa there in the in the white shirt, and uh, and Krista, they uh, were from Germany and they came over with Tom to. Uh, uh, to go on the raft trip with us. And uh, we did have some media interest. Uh, we had a, a team, I don't know, some of you may be, uh, may be able to remember the PM Magazine. Uh, it was usually on the afternoons. Um, and the crew from Kansas City was there with PM Magazine. I was, uh, I, I took, uh, I had a Nikon FE uh, with a 50 millimeter lens. That's what I had. And so um, I also had a, I took a, a long lens because I figured, well, that's why I'll need that because I want to take, you know, nature pictures. Um, but turns out I, uh, I wish I had a long, uh, wish I had a, a wide angle lens. Uh, because most of the, turns out most of the shooting I did, I was shooting things on the raft, the people on the raft. That's, those are most of the pictures that I took. So I, I kind of wish that I had taken, uh, taken a wide angle lens, but I didn't have one of those. And if anybody has any questions, at any point, just feel free. Um, 
here we're putting uh, installing the waterproofing around the around the cabin. How big was the cabin? Um, it was about forty eight square feet. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, Clegg and Krista. And that's uh, Krista and Afi. Um, all of these images were shot on Ektachrome 160 and then scanned digitally a few years back. And I converted a lot of them to, to black and white but they were all shot on ectochrome slide film. The black and white and color reminds me of when we had used to decide, okay, the budget, how much should we spend? Do we really want to spend it on color film right. or do we want to do black and white and I'll process it? <laughs> right. mm -hmm. You made those decisions on everything you shot. You know? Right. Yeah, I kind of wish I had taken black and white film with me, but I, I didn't. Um, I wanted to be able to drop the film off as we were going down the river to see what I was getting. Um, and I figured ectochrome was probably the best choice for that. This gentleman, um, he provided all of our lumber, all of our cut lumber. He provided the lumber and he cut it for us. He ran a lumber yard in Kansas City. There's uh, Krista working on the mosquito netting. Because we figured the mosquitoes would, uh, would were likely to be a big problem. Um, we two had two telephone poles that were the outboard beams on the starboard uh, starboard side, um, and uh, and uh, we we needed something sturdy. Um, so so that so that's what so that's what those are. So they're like outriggers. Uh huh. Well, not outriggers, but they they were. The, they were the outside beams. Mm -hmm. and you can kind of see here, um, that's looking at the uh, raft from the side. Um, the, the barrels were lined uh, in the direction of, of travel. And then you had the, the, uh, the two telephone poles on the outside and then the center beam running down the, the middle and uh, the barrels were attached to the wood, uh, wood framing by uh, metal banding machines. We had uh, folks that come out and did that for us. Uh, there was no electricity at the park so we had to run all of our tools uh, on a generator and our generator broke down, of course. So, so these gentlemen were, help, were helping us fix, fix our generator. Leg. Now that gives you a that's a good overall view. It gives you an idea of what the raft ultimately looked like. Um, um, the the main deck was sixteen by twenty four feet, and then the 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 cabin was like forty eight square feet, something like that. And we spent a lot of time up on the top. Uh, was, uh, at, a minimum, at a minimum, there were, there were always at least six people, six crew people 
we got up to nine at one point because we would have people get off and, and come on. There was a core crew of six people that went the entire way. Um, I wasn't sure. Um, had, uh, can't really see the, see these little, uh, yeah. those are ore locks. Um, and I'll, I'll show you later, there were 10, uh, there were four 10 foot long oars. Um, and we used that to, to steer and, and, and maneuver the raft. Um, we later determined that the, the engineering on these oar locks was, was uh, sorely insufficient. Uh, so we we uh, stopped at a a metal um, a metal shop just south of St. Louis, and had some uh, folks build us some new oar locks um, for free. Usually, find out quick for them. We just blank it. That's right, and that, that's what that's what it was. Yeah, because we would you know you the thing weighed about three thousand pounds. So you, in order to move it, you really had to, you stood on the deck and put your weight into the, into the oars and walked across the deck to move the oars. So that you were using a lot of pressure. And uh, those little sticks, those little metal sticks basically just weren't up to, to holding, holding things in place. from everybody online when we ask a question they can't hear it so if you'll repeat our question okay. before sure. you answer it then okay. everybody will hear we'll do so i'll start how long did it take you guys to build it uh, about two weeks uh, it uh, took us about two weeks question. to build it yeah mm -hmm. repeat your question right I'll just re repeat the question right so. right yeah. we uh uh question was uh, how long did it take to build it and it took us uh, about two weeks and so uh, when we were finished with the main construction we were probably a hundred yards away from the river so how do you get a three thousand pound raft from um, where we built it out to the river. So what we did was we hired uh, two um, tow trucks um, and they picked it up on each end and, and, and lifted it up off the ground. You can see there, um, it's sort of bowing in the middle, flexing a little bit there and, and the river uh, a little bit. And then when we got the front uh, tow truck down close to the river, uh, we put a dolly underneath the front of the raft and the back uh, tow truck backed the raft down into the, down the ramp into the river. And you can see the, we're doing that here. So we had a little audience for our launch. This was July the 3rd, I believe. Where did you all launch? It was uh, from uh, Labanite State Park. Uh, we launched uh, from Labanite State Park in, uh, in Independence, Missouri. Uh, it's still there. The boat ramp is still there. So I went, I went to visit Tom just a few weeks ago. Um, and we went out there and, and uh, and looked around. It hasn't changed much.
Okay. I've got a question from Deshaun. Okay. Um, he says, I'm curious to see the video the guy was recording too. How was the trip overall? Any moments you would like to comment on? And did they do a video? And they did, and I do have, um, I do have that. It's a, it was a two-part story. It's probably a total of about 16 minutes long, um, and uh, we can watch that if if you want to after. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, but uh, they they did do a story. Mm -hmm. So this is. Uh, uh, these are the improved ore locks. You can see that uh, uh, they have uh, supports coming out the side, that are much more solid. And you can also see here where I might have uh, taken advantage of a, of a wider angle lens. <laughs> but that, that's basically, that's what I had, so. Yeah, that's the old or lock. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons we had oars was to avoid things like these, uh, they were net navigation buoys. And basically the purpose of those was to show uh, mostly the, the, the toes, the tugs on the river where the channel the river channel is that is where the move water is moving quickest. Uh, those are marked off with these buoys, and if we had run into one, it would have been a bad day. Um, they are much larger than they look like uh, from half a mile away. This is the uh, first night on the river, her first dinner on the river. Did you carry supplies with you to eat? We did carry supplies with us to eat. We carried food. We had some ice chests. And so we carried uh, food with us and, and fresh water. Um, for people that were floating down a river, we spent a lot of time going to get water. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, but we, we had uh, a Coleman stove and ice chests. And so we, whenever we would pull into a little town, we would go to the local grocery and, and, and load up on food. And Tom uh, had experience as uh, uh, a chef. So, um, and uh, so that came in handy. So this is, this is, the first morning on the river. This is July the 4th. And so there were a lot of people out on the river on July the 4th and they were, so we had a lot of visitors, a lot of people curious about, about what the hell we were doing. <laughs> Did you have to have it Coast Guard approved or did you do anything? We uh, did not. Uh, I'm still not sure whether we were supposed to have it approved by the Coast Guard or not. Um, but nobody stopped us. Nobody, nobody stopped us. Um, in fact, uh, a couple of times we had help from the Coast Guard and I'll show you that in a, in a few minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, we weren't aware of any regulations or anything like that that we had to follow. 
Um, it, probably so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, uh, we weren't aware of any regulations or anything like that, but, uh, um, but we didn't have, we didn't ask. So <laughs> somebody, somebody said no. So what year did you say this was? 1981. Yes. We've got another question from Emily. She mm -hmm. says, these photos are marvelous. Can you talk about your thought process in selecting the ones you're showing tonight? Um, yeah, Emily wants to know uh, my thought process of choosing the photos that I'm showing tonight. Um, Basically, I'm showing all the ones that I think are decent. So, <laughs> um, um, I spent a lot of time over the years reworking these images, you know, converting them to black and white, for example, and um, actually cheating a little bit on some of them. Uh, you'll probably notice on some of them, uh, especially the ones in black and white, there's a really dramatic sky um, that was actually not there. Uh, but I, I discovered uh, Photoshop's sky replacement fun function, um, which comes in really handy, um, I find. Um, so on um, some of these photographs, the that's a real sky on that photograph, but on some of them, the sky is enhanced. Uh, but uh, um, but the, uh, I did have to do uh, quite a bit of work, cleanup work on the original um, uh, slides, because basically I was working from, they were mounted on in the old cardboard slide holders. And uh, so they were kind of dirty. Um, but, uh, but this is basically the final, final product. I think this was in Cairo, Illinois, if memory serves. I think this was in New Madrid, Missouri, south of St. Louis. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, again, we, we would have to, folks come up and just uh, talk with us and ask us what we were doing. and. Um, <clears throat> There's another good view of the the new the enhanced ore locks. Could it have ground over those corners or anything? Um, we, <laughs> it, we we did later. You'll see in some of the pictures later. Yeah, they they become uh, we we round we whittled them down. <laughs> yeah, we did. We uh, we we whittled down the edges of those handles on the oars so that they weren't as sharp. And that's, uh, that's outside New Madrid, uh, <clears throat> Missouri. How much were the oars used for moving versus steering? Did you see the current yeah. carrier? Yeah, the current, uh, Almost exclusively, the, the the oars were used just to maneuver in and out of the current and uh, to avoid um, obstacles like um, um, like toes. You'd have a toe coming down with like sixteen barges attached to it, and it 
looked like a piece of Iowa had broken off and it was floating down the, the river at us. So that's when we use the oars to, to get out of the way of stuff like that and to, and to maneuver to dock at night. But well, didn't have a radio either. we had one radio. Uh, it was a little transistor radio and I have a picture of it. I'll show you. A little bit like, that's right yeah. right yeah no no two-way radio right yeah but there there was a there's a system on the river where the toes can communicate with us they they toot um like if they toot once that means i'm going to pass you to your left they toot twice they're going to pass you on your left if they Toot four times. It means get the hell out of the way. I'm, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So that's how they communicated with us. We must have been looked hungry because people kept giving us food. That was some. Uh, that was some pretty good catfish. Yeah, that's a huge, it was a huge catfish. Well, we didn't have the tools to clean it. So he cleaned it for us. Oh, that's me. I didn't take this picture. <laughs> There's Rick with the uh, Zen and the art. Mm -hmm. I still, don't know what the deal with the fork is, but in his collar. But. This is a little place in Missouri uh, on the Missouri River called Herman. Uh, and uh, they had they had a tractor pool. So we went we went to the tractor pool. I think these folks are related to each other. I'm not sure, but so this is this is just north of St. Louis, uh, just after the Missouri River uh, empties into the Mississippi, um, and just north of St. Louis, there's an area where there's. Uh, a bunch of rocks that jut up from the surface from from the bottom of the river, and is uh, at low where the when the river is low, it's a danger to navigation. So they built uh, uh, a canal around that area. Um, they built a lock, a dam, and a lock and a canal. It's, it's called the Chain of Rocks Canal. Um, and so for some reason that I still don't remember, we decided to go through the canal instead of going down the river. But the problem with the canal is that there's no current, the water doesn't move. And the canal is eight miles long. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so here we're trying to, we tried pulling ourselves along as Tom out front with a rope and walking along the uh, trying to pull us forward and, and Clegg there is keeping the raft from uh, beaching uh, with, with a two by four. And we did that for a couple of hours and probably went maybe a hundred yards. Um, so that's when the Coast Guard shows up. And uh, I said, do you guys want to tow? And we said, sure, <laughs> that sounds good. Erin has, has chatted that she needs to run, okay. but she's enjoyed the images very much. And uh, she says, I feel like I want to float down the river on a homemade barge right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Right. Exactly. So they they hooked us up uh, to the side of their ship, um, and uh, at at each corner of the raft we had a, a cleat, which is where uh, it's uh, 
it's a little metal utensil that you use to to hook ropes up to and, and to tie off at night. And so we use those cleats uh, to attach to ropes to attach to the Coast Guard ship uh, to tow us along. Um, and that went okay for a little while until uh, one of the cleats popped out of the, so there were, we were putting too much pressure on it. And the cleat went flying through the air. Fortunately, it, it didn't hit anybody. So, so put you on their boat. Right. <laughs> right. He gave you a life preserver. Test. Yes, that's right. They they made us put on life preservers. Um, so that's what's happening here. The we popped the cleat, and um, these gentlemen are telling the the captain to to hold off to to stop. And so uh, we reattach the cleat and uh, um, put some more ropes uh, to different attachment points. Thank you. And then what we also did was we put uh, some ballast on the back of the raft because the, the raft was, ten, is, was wanting to nose down into the river as it was being towed. So we put some ballast, in, including Ed, on, on the back of the raft. And there's Ed and Tom as ballast. So we got through the, the canal finally and uh, floated into St. Louis and it was uh, a late evening when we when we got into St. Louis. And here we're going. So we're now we're on the Mississippi. We're um, going going for water here. Oh yeah, uh, fake sky. <laughs> Safety. She's a, uh, well, she's retired now, but she was a, uh, uh, she went back to Germany with, with Krista. They were, they were both high school teachers. Uh, that's the inside of the cabin. And uh, the, uh, uh, the stove is here on the left. Um, most of the folks uh, that were on the trip had the good sense to bring rain gear. I was not one of those folks, <laughs> but uh, it, it rained reasonably frequently. Here uh, we had gotten ourselves into a, a little fix. We um, um, floated up to the up uh, current side of a dock. Uh, but then when we tried to get, get ourselves off, since we didn't have a motor, uh, that wasn't easy. So here we're using uh, brute force to try to uh, wedge ourselves off the dock because the, the current was pushing us into it. It's a lot of force. This gives you a little perspective. This is the Mississippi, which is a much bigger river than the Missouri. <laughs> so I think these monitors here are not as contrasty as these in case in case you're interested. These are kind of contrasty, but these are less contrasty. How did you keep your camera dry this whole time? Well, I had one of those, uh, uh, it was a, a metal case 
that I bought. Um, and, I, and I carried it in, the, in a metal case. Also, I, I also had with me a Hasselblad uh, 500C with a standard 80 millimeter lens. But for whatever reason, I just didn't use it. I don't know why. Maybe it was just inconvenient or, but I just, uh, I would have been better off to bring the wide angle lens <laughs> for my 35. Going for water again. This is a gentleman who was giving us a ride back from our water collecting. This is a uh, this is uh, us trying to get ourselves out of another fix we got ourselves into. Uh, all along the river, there's these little tributaries called chutes. Uh, they're basically just little tributaries that go, they don't run into the river, they run out of the river and take you back into wherever. You have no idea where. And if you're not careful, you can get sucked into one. And we got sucked into this one once. And uh, with no motor, uh, we couldn't row ourselves back against the current strongly enough to, to get out. So we dropped anchor and tried to pull ourselves back up against the current. That's what we're, what's, that's what, uh, uh, we're doing here. We're trying to pull ourselves, that, that didn't work. But they, they made pretty good pictures. Um, Anchor, you, this were, these were mushroom anchors, weren't they? No, it was a standard anchor with the, the, the there were two points. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we saw this a lot uh, on the river. This, like I said, 1981, uh, the, the interstates had just uh, uh, come in like 10 or 20 years earlier. And the trucking was taking a lot of business away from the river traffic. So a lot of the river towns were in economic distress at that time. So we saw a lot of uh, closed theaters, closed businesses uh, along the river. Thank you. How many rolls of film do you think you shot the whole trip? Um, 15 to 20, something like that. Yeah, I probably shot 15 to 20 rolls of film during the trip. Mm -hmm. now, this is another image I cheated on. In, in the uh, original image, the, the top of the image basically bisects the sun. This right here was the end of, end of the image. So what I did was I took this much of the image and copied it and flipped it and added it on top of the image and um, I'm more satisfied with this than I was with the, with the half sun. Oh, this is a gentleman that came along and tried to pull us out of the chute and he nearly sunk his boat <laughs> trying, <laughs> trying to do it. <laughs> this is also in Cairo, Illinois, I believe. This is uh, Louisiana. We uh, 
ran into a family that uh, on the river and they invited us to their house for dinner. So this is us, they're, they're towing us up to their, their, they lived right on the river, their house. So they're, they're towing us up um, for dinner. Uh, those kids, uh, they were mature beyond their years. <laughs> Is, is what I remember. And this is uh, this is not from a drone. This is before drones. This is uh, I. It was easy to run ahead of the raft mm -hmm. on the bank. And uh, you you climb on a bridge, and wait for the raft to 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 drift underneath you. So that's that's how I got that shot. There's the transistor radio. Um, so that was basically our link to the outside world. This is this was the. Um, summer of the Princess Di's royal wedding. That was that summer. Um, it was also the summer of uh, Rick Springfield's Jesse's Girl, which we probably heard 10,000 times. But, but, uh, uh, but behind getting water, the, get, making sure that that radio had batteries was probably our number one, number two priority. This is in uh, St. Genevieve, Missouri, I believe. That, that theater is still there. It's now a live music venue, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> they gave us fish too. It's another one shot from, from the bridge. Thank you. Some of you've probably seen this photograph because I believe it was in the JCC show a year or two ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is in uh, the Mississippi Delta. Um, Right off, right off the river. No I don't. Yeah, it's probably south of it's Vicksburg, I believe. In Mississippi. In Mississippi, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the name of your boat? It's called the Orlean Spiegel. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a character from German mythology. Um, he's like, a, I guess the closest equivalent would be like a court jester. And he goes, he travels from town to town and made fun of the local um, intelligentsia and the local uh, land barons. Uh, so that's that's uh, the that's what we named the, the raft. Oh yeah, you can see here where we whittle down the yeah. the the. <laughs> A lot of barges, a lot of barge traffic, a lot of tows. And those things are loud, especially when you're on one. Did you have to go through any locks? 
uh, we only had to go through that one lock just north of St. Louis. Uh, south of there, there are no dams or locks on the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ed was an artist, um, a sculptor, and so he, he drew this map uh, on, on the side of the raft showing our, our path down the river and our, our target New Orleans. This is uh, Mitch Riley. Uh, and, and, uh, and this is the a raft called the La Toile du, du Nord. Uh, it's, it was from uh, Minnesota, uh, where the headwaters of the Mississippi is. Uh, Lance was a lawyer who decided he didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. So he quit and built this raft uh, with his friend, and they floated down. Uh, the Mississippi River. Um, actually, I, I believe that uh, they didn't go all the way to New Orleans. They took the Red River over into Texas, I believe. But we we floated along with them for a while. Um, after we we met up with them just so, uh, north of Vicksburg. And so this is, uh, this is Vicksburg, and this is uh, Olin Spiegel and Latoile du Nord leaving. Sean is asking, what happened to the raft once you all got to New Orleans? Okay, what happened to the raft once we got to New Orleans? We sold it uh, for $40 uh, to a restaurant that was on Lake Pontchartrain. They towed it around to the restaurant and pulled it up and put tables and chairs out on it and made it a part of their restaurant. Is it still there? It was destroyed by a hurricane. I don't, I'm not sure which one, but yeah, the, the, yeah, they've had a few, yeah, if you, the, the sides of the raft are basically like huge sails and the wind just flip the raft over on its back. This is some film that I had processed somewhere and they did not, they did a bad job. They, they didn't stop, they, they didn't do the stopping uh, process correctly, so the film was kind of messed up, but I managed to salvage this out of it. It's another closed theater. Early 80s, was that E4 process or E6? I think it was E6 by then. Mm -hmm. Photograph processing calls is it the scope? Okay. Okay. Twelve. Okay. Twelve. Thanks. That's uh. This uh. This is Jeff. He's a was an interesting character. He he got on with us at St. Louis, and he had just come off of a round the world trip on an old sailing ship, uh, uh, like a, a Christopher Columbus style sailing ship. It was one of those deals where you can uh, get on board and and work. Uh, so that that's where he had just come from when he when he joined the our crew. And when 
after the trip was over, he went down to uh, work on the oil rigs in the Gulf. And this is a tow that we ran into the, the Mr. Jason. And we got, we got tours of uh, a lot of tows. Um, because they were, they were eager to show us their ship because they wanted to see ours. Also, I think they wanted to talk to Kristen and Afy. Look at this t-shirt, yeah. cable satellite day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the city of Baytown had, uh, I hope they had a successful cable satellite day. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, those are awesome. <laughs> this is Jeff tying up. So this, yeah, this last image, this is just a few weeks ago. This is up in Kansas City. That's the, that's the ramp where we put in and uh, at, uh, at the park and that's Tom there. Um, I was also going to show you here. Let's see here. Tom, um, Tom has uh, three daughters and uh, you may have to go back to zoom and okay. share to okay. you're gonna show that to yeah let's see here let's see I've got a video I wanted to share. Okay. Um, um, go ahead and just pull it up and we'll see if it starts playing. Okay, let's see. And and let's see here. Yeah, that's not going to share it. Okay. So while it's up, okay. go back to Zoom. Let's see. Here. Leave, yeah, leave that one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Julie and I now are doing the kind of the kinky thing of okay. traveling around playing music. They, uh, Julie and I now are doing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now you may have to end screen sharing and then come okay. back in to that video. Okay. Go up to the top where. Yeah. Okay. Stop share. Yeah. Where it's yeah, stop share. Uh -huh. Okay. And then new share. Down to the bottom, share screen. Okay. Right here? Yep. Okay. And choose the movie. Okay. Yeah, may have to go to files. Everybody out there, hang on just a second. We're trying to share a video. Can throw something in. I'm not sure how to get to this. So. Yeah. Can you go to files and navigate from the yeah right there? Let's see. It looks like it has to be on your here. Hmm. It's in my um. It's on my um screen. It's yeah um. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to. Um, yeah, yeah. Go back to basic and click on um, the top. Yeah. Click on 
Any thoughts, anybody? I don't think we. I don't think we're gonna be able to share it without it being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is optimized screen sharing for video clip. Yeah. Do that. Oh, there we go. Try share, I guess. We're about to add two up there at the top, but plus mm -hmm. you can't pull it into your PowerPoint, can you? And we can also post the video on our page somewhere. Okay. So if we can do that. Um, okay. I'm going to put that out here. We'll post the video. On Snap social media. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying, any more questions up there? Well, you may have it. Yeah. Basically, what this video is, it's um, uh, one of Tom's daughters is a musician. She's a fiddle player in a bluegrass duo called um, uh, called uh, Match Sellers. And uh, her friend, her partner, wrote a song about the raft trip after he she told him about it. So that's what this video is. It's of the of them performing this song. Yeah, we'd like to see it. Yeah. Well, let's um, if you all want to, if you want to finish up the meeting, then we can play it here. They just won't be able to see it online. Sure. Can we do that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Anything else um, for meeting wise? Anything else? I don't have anything else. Okay. Um, let me let them know out there. We're gonna post it. Okay, it's Robin again. Thanks for everybody who joined. We will put the video on social media. Uh, right now, we're gonna watch it in the room, but we can't seem to get it on the Zoom meeting. So thank you guys for joining. Does anybody have any questions? Um, Lisa, thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. Oh, Julie and I now are doing the kind of a kooky thing of traveling around playing music. They traveled around, they built this like raft out of like a bunch of junk. <laughs> and then they sa sailed, floated. floated, somehow made it from Kansas City all the way down to New Orleans. And what year was that? 1981. 1981. Wow. And Julie first told me the story, and I was like, that is a bunch of BS. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why would anybody do that? That's a terrible idea. <laughs> How long did it actually take? Uh, it took two months. Two months? It took two weeks to build it and two months to float it. How much did you make it, Heather? A bunch of junk. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Why did it take so long? <coughs> there was no motor. We just floated. Yeah. Wow. Mississippi's kind of slow. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have oars or anything? We had oars, but that was just to uh, to steer and get out of the way of the barges. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, I was like, like you guys, I was like, oh, baloney. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly, then I saw this little documentary piece that they did in like 1981, or apparently. <laughs> they did a little, like, 20-minute segment on some uh, TV magazine. And I saw it, and I was like, that's your dad, really, Julie? <laughs> but yeah, Wayne was in a couple shots in there, too. So anyway, this is a tune I wrote about their experience uh, called Rolled Away on a Riverboat. That's kind of the working title here. If anybody's interested, I, I can play this video from the television station. Yeah. If, yeah, if, you, if you'd like to yeah. see that. Is there a size of binders in here? It's just coming off as we don't somehow this audio is not coming through the speakers. Oh, it's I just on his laptop, so I apologize for that. Um, there's another cord we're supposed to put hook up for sound, and I think somebody swiped it because yeah. it's <laughs> over no. there. That's fine. Yeah, no, we can if we move this like pop over that way, we can uh, look it up. But... <laughs> Oh, good. Hey. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Are we still on the Zoom? I think so. Let's okay. Just try it. Yeah, we'll just see if it comes out. Yeah. Looks like it is. Yeah, I'm just going to play it when you get it. Yeah. 
I can imagine your parents probably were shocked and appalled that you all were going to attempt this trip. What, what was the yeah? What uh, was the best advice and the worst advice you got about the trip? Well, my yeah, my uh, when I told my parents, uh, my mom said. You're doing what? <laughs> and my dad says, my dad said, he's going. <laughs> if I have to drive him, he's going. No, that's yeah. Our scout trip was going to paddle down to Cumberland for a certain day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been sure I graduated in 1980 and Tim Fraser and I, we both thought about doing it independently. We both bicycles from the Newfound Gap and Smoky's. Oh, cool. Mm. Wow. Ten days, nine days, yeah. two days. Yeah. Was that the original bicycle ride across the Pretty much. Uh, Tennessee? <laughs> he was a star for the conservation. Oh, cool. Thing, so. You know, one, one, of the girl, one of the photo girls is climbing uh, Mount Kilimanjaro right yeah, now. I know. And then another friend of mine, Amanda, has done the pilgrimage for Santiago pilgrimage in Spain. And it's just like a cat pilgrimage. It's supposedly. Uh, St. James, supposedly. Oh, I know. Yeah. And it's like 119 miles. It's just understanding. This is a two part. <laughs> The Missouri River is steeped in both fact and folklore. It's fostered the growth of the cities and towns that sprung up on its banks, and yet it holds a certain mystery and fascination that seems to draw people in. Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn gave in to the excitement of the river and set out on a simple raft. There he found adventure, friendship, and... But those simple days of rolling on the river are gone. Or are they? What fascinated me about the book Huckleberry Finn was that... These, this little community of two, at least in that book, of Huck and, and Jim, uh, were floating down a river and forming their own little community on the river. And they were in visual contact, but were separated from the, the established society on either banks. Tom Bates has a dream, to build a raft from scrap lumber and materials to float down the Missouri to the Mississippi, from Kansas City all the way to New Orleans. It's an ambitious dream, considering that none of these modern-day Huck Finns has any construction experience, and none have been on the Missouri or the Mississippi rivers. Everything is a learn-by-doing experience. One of my romantic plans about the trip two years ago was just to come down here and grab some scrap wood and tear down, maybe tear down an old shack and throw a raft together and start floating. But these two rivers are treacherous. They're, they're very unpredictable. Uh, the currents in them could, could tear any craft like we're building, could tear it apart if you're not careful. And that's, that's a little frightening. Taking off down the river on a primitive raft is a big undertaking. So how do you cope with leaving behind all the modern conveniences of today's world? I'm, I'm anticipating bathing in the river, actually. Because it's it's very muddy, but I think it's as far as getting clean, your own body sweat of getting getting clean in that sense. I don't know if I'd like to jump into that chocolate icing out there and, and hope to get clean. I do they have leeches? Well, Are there never, leeches out here? No, no leeches. Oh, okay. Maybe a lamprey or two on your knee. And what about food? Food? Well, we've we've had some very good luck with. Uh, so far with people donating food just in the area. We've, we have several cases of, of food that uh, we can use on the trip and of course do a lot of fishing over the edge of the boat and I make a mean Creole sauce so that should be good on catfish I think. And then so you don't feel too cut off from the world you take a little bit of home with you.
finally all the hours of hard work and preparation begin to pay off and the raft takes shape. Why in the world would anyone do this? Well, to, initially to see a dream fulfilled. That even while we, all my planning into this was was uh, done in, in earnest and was serious, I just never knew if it would take place. And not only is it is it sitting there right in front of me now, but the. The group effort that went into building this was exceeded any expectation I, I could have had. It Just having completed it is, is a great sort of set, uh, great source of satisfaction for me. Now the next is if it floats, and then if we can make it to New Orleans. That would, and that brings up a couple of interesting questions. Will the raft float? And how do you go about getting a 3,000 pound raft from the park where you built it to the river 200 feet away? The way I pictured it is that when this is finished, two trucks will come up, one on this end, on the other, these tow trucks. We'll hook up on both ends, we'll lift it up and take it the 200 foot over to the, near the river. And we'll set it down on a dolly so that the back is on a dolly, and we'll back it down the ramp into the river. But that may be easier said than done. If we drop any more barrels, it's going to be a mess. After all that work, what if it sinks? Okay. It's Now that it's in the water, it's time to check out the final accommodations. This is the cabin. This is your basic bucket of bolts. These are shelves for books and or cooking materials, a cooking counter, a food storage area, and a storage area. As you might note, there's no toilet. We need a toilet. No. This will be home for Tom, Afy, Krista, and the other rafters for eight weeks. Eight weeks of hard work, bad weather, boredom, and a journey back in time into the lure and lore of the river. It's a long way from Kansas City to New Orleans when you let the river be your guide, 1,450 miles to be exact. But that only serves as a challenge to these seven young people who've packed up their gear and set out on a crude raft they built from the ground up. Now the Missouri is a fairly peaceful river. Once you learn to maneuver your vessel and keep out of the way of the barges, Oh, look, they just saw it. It's, they started cutting towards the bank. But the river isn't always that busy. There's still plenty of time to kick back and just enjoy drifting along. We're going to catch.
catch us a barge. But there's more to it than just rolling on the river. There's a lot of work to be done, like battling the current to dock every night. Now, sometimes that can be a real problem. Well, the first dike we had, was, uh, just, just outside of Kansas City, we had a dike, and we looked at the barrel, and it was, the raft we was sinking. We thought we were sinking, and we, thought, we were convinced, but we didn't realize we were all standing on the sinking barrel, right. looking, eight people standing there, it, it were sinking. sinking, and it was just, the raft was tilting down into the water, we thought, we're lower on this side, we're gonna, we're dying. Yeah. Well, the raft didn't go down, and while the crew counted its blessings, there were still some rough times ahead. Take, for instance, St. Louis, where the Missouri turns the corner and meets the mighty Mississippi. What a raft. Just come alongside and we'll take you to the locks with us. After finally making it through the locks, more trouble was on the way. An electrical storm hit that rocked the raft on its barrels. In pitch darkness, just six miles from St. Louis, the rafters were challenged once again. The channel's right there on the left. No, it looks like a bar. We're doing really good. Keep cracking. We're going to make it. Suddenly, out of the darkness, a barge on a collision course with the raft. Somebody helping Rick on this side. Watch yours. We're going to hit. Such a easy. Don't get hurt on this. I felt like a speck of dust in the cyclone. I, I didn't know. I couldn't feel the control that we had on, on the raft anymore. I just... It was a whole different animal, and uh, that's frightening. Needless to say, after St. Louis, everyone was a little leery of the Mississippi, but it is the only river that goes to New Orleans, so they continued onward, keeping a close eye on their detailed maps and charts. Just ahead, near disaster at a place called Devil's Island, where the raft was sucked into a chute of water and careened out of control. Boy, it... <laughs> and you couldn't tie off because it was just snake-infested territory. Yeah. And yeah, you get too yeah. close, there's snakes in the trees, there's snakes everywhere, and, and there's no way, there's nothing to beach against because it go, the water was high, it was right up to, into the trees, and there was a bayou behind it. And this. And I remember what, I was on the rear oar. And I was, just as we neared it, I, I watched the person on the front or in front of me drop down about three feet because we went over and he just went <laughs> and we bounced over it and rode it out. And it was... Not all the days were filled with danger, though. Most of the time there was swimming, reading, or just taking in some of the sights. Living on the river is a non-stop learning experience. Every day, you. And the snakes. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> We're going to be dead in three minutes. <laughs> now that's that's Four something that somebody told get us. Get out of the way. Yeah, that's what, that's <laughs> that's what danger. somebody told us. If, you, if you've heard four tubes, you know, go for your Bail life. Out. Go for your Bail life. Bail out. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see them all. Get me out of here. The Mississippi River has a way of changing people, and the members of this crew are no exception. It was, it's been a kind of an overriding gloom. Yeah. That uh, that I felt ever since Memphis or so. It's just something that you know that I, I, I won't be seeing. Yeah. Oh, you become a family. Tom, Bob, Ippy, Bob, Bob. <laughs> Ed, Bob, Jeff, Bob, Mike, Bob. The one bit of truth about this voyage is that uh, I and the others, I'm sure, will never be the same. It's going to be a part of us. The river, that is. The river will be a part of us. It seemed that the closer the raft got to New Orleans, the slower things went. While traffic on the river kept increasing, the current kept decreasing. Outside of Baton Rouge, it slowed down to one mile per hour. Just 40 miles outside New Orleans, the raft hit something they called dead water. Spirits dragged, depression set in, and eventually the Coast Guard was called on for a little help. 
At last, the skyline of New Orleans, the landing spot, a place called Canal Street. And though they landed in a downpour, not even the rain could dampen their spirits or sense of accomplishment. I think I feel our arrival here in New Orleans is as is, is, is great a joy as it is a sorrow. It, it was a great trip. We had a, a lot of problems once in a while. We had a lot of fun. We met incredibly nice people. We learned a lot about ourselves, about other people. I'm kind of a sucker. I, can't, I believe in the great American dream. That's, you know, if you have an objective, you, can, you just do it. We're all here. Sure. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> all right, everybody out there on. Okay, everybody out on Zoom. We're going to end the Zoom meeting. Thanks for joining us.